good evening, you guys. Good evening. How are y'all? All, y- all y'all. I'm not even from the South either, y'all. Y'all, y'all, y'all. Yeah, here's my little surfboard shirt. <laughs> all right. Well, good to see you. Good to be here. Good to enjoy this time together, right? You bet. So why don't we, what do you say we pray? And then we'll open our Bibles. Father, we want to give you thanks tonight, Lord, for your blessings in our life. You are such an awesome, loving Father, and we are so blessed to be your children, Lord. We thank you so much for bringing us together tonight, that we might open your word together and just learn uh, from it. And uh, we thank you, God, for your Holy Spirit that teaches us. We ask that you would be our teacher tonight. Um, And Lord, open our hearts uh, to be sensitive to you and what you might be speaking to us this evening. And we want to thank you for what you're doing and what you are going to continue to do. I want to take a minute, Lord, and uh, pray for those who are uh, sick, uh, ailing in our church. Uh, especially uh, Robin. Uh, Right now, I just want to bring her before you, Lord, and pray that uh, you continue to give her faith and strength and be with Kelly, Lord, and help him to to rest in your arms during these difficult times. Um, And Lord, anybody else that might be struggling in our fellowship, I know there are others. Uh, Lord, we just want to bring them before you. You know who they are. Uh, Be with them. Be with their families. And, uh, Father, we just want to commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So why don't you open up with me to 2 Kings. We're going to start 2 Kings tonight. One of the things uh, you might be interested in or may not be interested in, uh, the... These books that we have that we're studying, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, originally those were, there wasn't one and two, there was only one. They were all one long, big book. And back in about, I don't know, maybe 150 A.D. or so, when they translated uh, the scripture, I believe, into Greek, that's when they broke these books up into separate uh, you know, First and Second Kings, First and Second Samuel. So as we're reading, you know, you just kind of understand that the story just continues to flow. You know, as though uh, there wasn't Second Kings. It's just as though First Kings just keeps on going through. And one of the things we're going to see right away is our our buddy Ahab um, is one of the first ones mentioned in our scripture here. And uh, Ahab doesn't have a very big part in uh, 2 Kings. And he obviously, he doesn't learn (laughs) from experience. You know, how important is it to learn from experience, right? I mean, who doesn't make mistakes? I think everyone makes mistakes. Um, And, you know, even when you're serving the Lord, I think sometimes... We have to take risks once in a while, right? We have to step out once in a while. And we might be leery of doing that. We might think, oh, my gosh, what if it doesn't go right? Or, you know, somebody doesn't listen right or takes it wrong or personal or whatever. But, you know, you got to step out. Sometimes, for me at least, in my experience, sometimes I'll step out like that and then I'll think, oh, my gosh, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that, right? Um, hopefully next time I'll be a little bit quicker on my feet uh, and more careful. So anyway, we should be, as believers, uh, learning from our mistakes. And we should be learning from our victories. But, you know, I think that God is so patient with us and so willing to work with us that we can be an example of His grace Because when we do make a mistake, when we do trip, when we do stumble, we can get back up. We can learn from it. You know, have you ever had a 
a personal problem with anybody, just rub you the wrong way, you know, and maybe you lose patience with them or you say something that you wish you wouldn't have said and then you think, you know what, next time that happens, I'm going to remember that proverb that says, a soft answer turns away wrath. So, lessons to be learned. Now, our king buddy here, Ahab, he doesn't seem to uh, think that he needs to learn from his mistakes. So, um, Ahab is going to have an encounter, one more encounter with God. So, let's start reading chapter 1, and we will go down through here together. It says in verse 1 that Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. All right. So that's a summation of what we're going to read about. That, ver- that sentence probably should have been put down and around the end of the chapter, you know. But the, the writer, the one that wrote this, he kind of gives up the plot before we get to it by saying, oh, Ahab, he died. Um, so this is what we're going to see here in verse 2. I'm sorry, I'm speaking of Ahaziah. Ahaziah fell through the lattice of his upper room in Samaria. We know what happened to Ahab. We're talking about Ahaziah now. I apologize. And he was injured. So sometimes in those houses back there when they would build them, you know, sometimes they would have a bottom floor and they would have an upper floor and it would be kind of like a patio and they would do a lot of their living up in the upper Uh, area, and the patio, if you will, many times was enclosed uh, in lattice. And you know, lattice isn't very sturdy. You could break through it pretty easy. So evidently, old Ahaziah here has lattice in his upper room, and he falls through it, uh, and he falls down, and he is injured. Now, if you get injured or if you get sick, you should... First thing you should do is pray, and then call a friend and say, please put me on the prayer chain because I'm going through this or I'm going through that. We should seek the Lord, right, immediately. And again, we see the the flaw here with Ahaziah that he does not do that. He wants to inquire, but he doesn't want to inquire of, of the Lord. So what's he do? He says, He sends messengers and said to them, Go inquire from Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover from this injury. So, Baalzebub, do you uh, recall that name in any scriptures that we've studied in the past? Jesus talked about him, didn't he? He talked about this false god. Baalzebub was actually the lord of the flies. Why they worship flies, I have no clue. But, uh, you know, people back then, they worshiped some strange things, didn't they? The Egyptians worshiped frogs and, you know, different things like that. And uh, so they loved frogs so much, God gave them a bunch of frogs. Um, You know, uh, the things that people will stoop to, if you will, in an effort to avoid the creator of the universe, are pretty amazing. So this fella, Ahaziah, he goes to inquire of the god of Ekron. The god of Ekron, Baalzebub, um, they had all kinds of cult practices um, in in Ekron, and it was very close uh, to where Ahaziah was, so he sends the messengers there. But in verse 3, the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, the Tishbite, Arise, and go up and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say to them, It is, or is it because there is no God in Israel that you are going to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord, You shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. And then Elijah departed. And when the messengers returned to him, he said to them, Why have you come back? And they said to him, A man came up to meet us and said to us, 
Go, return to the king who sent you and say to him, Thus saith the Lord. Is it because there is no God in Israel that you're sending to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore you shall not come down from the bed in which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. And then he said to him, What kind of a man was it who came up to meet you and told you these things? And they answered him and said, A hairy man, wearing a leather belt around his waist. And he said, It's Elijah the Tishbite. He knew who it was. He didn't like Elijah. And now he's angry. So, you know, we've talked about this in the past where the kings, uh, the rulers would surround themselves with yes men who would go and inquire of the Lord and then come back and give answers to uh, the king uh, that weren't from God. And they would say, oh, everything's great. Just keep planting your vineyards and making babies, and we're doing great. Everything's good to go. You know, uh, don't look over there because that's not a problem, you know, uh, kind of distracting the people from what was really going on. And that really frustrated the Lord, uh, the fact that uh, the kings would constantly take the advice of these false prophets over God's prophet every single time and the reason they did that was because most of the time God's prophets weren't bringing the news that they wanted to hear gee whiz sounds familiar doesn't it Um, we haven't changed very much over these millennia Uh, the human person is still flawed as he was back then Um, people turning to anything they can turn to Except for Jesus. And so, Elisha doesn't give them the news that Ahaziah wants to hear. And he gets angry, and he's dealt with this Elijah the Tishbite in the past. And now he's probably done dealing with them. So in verse 9, the king sent to him a captain of 50 with his 50 men. And so he went up to him, and there he was, sitting on the top of a hill. And he spoke to him, Man of God, the king has said, Come down. So Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, If I'm a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty men. And fire came down from heaven and consumed him. And his 50. Now, this is not the first time we've seen Elisha call fire down from heaven. Um, A lot of the commentators tend to think that this was actually lightning that came down and and killed these men. Pretty hot stuff. And uh, so, nevertheless, whatever it was, the fire came down at uh, Elijah's word. And consume the 50 men. Now, the typical uh, army, the way they, a lot of times the way they had these set up was they'd have a, uh, an officer over 50 men. Now, when you get it to Romans, the Romans had centurions. So they had guys that were over 100 soldiers. Uh, they called them centurions. In this case, we have... Um, leaders over groups of 50. And so he sends this first group to Elijah, and uh, we see what happened. And then in verse 11, then he sent to him another captain of 50 with his 50 men. And he answered and said to him, Man of God, thus has the king said, Come down quickly. So Elijah answered and said to them, If I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. And again, he sent a third captain of 50 with his 50 men. 
And the third captain of 50 went up, and he came and fell on his knees before Elijah and pleaded with him and said, Man of God, please let my life and the life of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. You can imagine him arriving on the scene. Elijah's still sitting on the hill, and there's a hundred dead dudes laying around, and they know they're next, you know. Uh, and so right away, this third captain of 50, he's got a little bit of wisdom by asking for mercy uh, from Elijah. Look, he said, fire has come down from heaven and burnt up the first two captains of 50s with their 50s. But let my life now be precious in your sight. And the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with him and do not be afraid of him. So he arose and he went down with him to the king. Now, I don't understand why these events happened the way they did. Um, why it was necessary to call fire down from heaven and take out these guys. Um, perhaps just to demonstrate the power of God. You might remember that most of these people, most of these men, most of these soldiers, they were worshiping other gods right along with everybody else. And so perhaps for them to be confronted by our God, by the Lord, and to see his power um, would shake things up a little bit. And it did when the third group showed up. They had a little bit more uh, wisdom there. And so he said in verse 16, thus said the Lord, because you sent messengers to inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, is it because there's no god in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. So once again, the word of the Lord does not change. It's exactly the same. There's no variance. There's no uh, change of plan. The prophecy is exactly the way it was when it was first spoken. And now he's speaking it to the man Ahaziah himself. So in verse 17, we see that Ahaziah died according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken. You know, back then it was really important that you had an heir, somebody to take your place when you finished ruling, whether it was from death or whatever. Um, but we see here that uh, Ahaziah does not have a son to take over. Um, so Jehoram becomes king in his place. In the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. So now you've got father and son, one ruling in Judah and the other ruling in Israel. Now the rest of the acts of Ahaziah, which he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? So, this, this king, Ahaziah, could he have, do you think, repented? Could he have had a change of heart? Could he have come before God and said, look, I, I've been a fool. I've sought out other gods, idols, false gods. And now I want to repent and I want to turn to you and I, and I want to live. Would God have heard that prayer? You think? Absolutely. I think it's in Isaiah where God is talking to the people and he's telling Israel, he's saying, look, if you would repent, if you would turn away from your wickedness, I would forgive you. But they would not. And so God's judgment came upon them. It's not as though they didn't have an opportunity. As a matter of fact, they've had Many, many opportunities, and I think there just comes a time uh, in the process of life where God just determines that your heart is too hard. Your heart will not change. 
Now, that's a bad place to find yourself. Is it a real place? I think so. I think it is. I think that you can rebel against God to the point that you become so numb to conviction that you could never repent. Your heart becomes too hard. We saw that with Pharaoh. We, saw it all, we see it all through the Bible with all of these kings. They all, like us, they had the same opportunity. They could have turned away from worshiping these false gods. They could have recommitted their life and their country to the Lord. They could have brought a revival. And God knows they needed revival. I think we need it, too, in our country. I think that this nation really needs to turn to God. I think that that's our only hope. You know, we're in the middle of this political stupidity that goes on every single day. Uh, and it's getting dumber and dumber as it goes. Um, but I have to... Um, assure you tonight that God is in control of what's going on. Sometimes it may not seem as though there's a plan because everything is so chaotic and it seems like everything is just falling apart at the seams. And if our country would turn from their wicked ways and repent, then God would once again bless this nation. But I don't believe that his hand of blessing is upon our nation because of our leaders. Now, his hand of blessing is upon you. It's upon us because we're his children. But you know, a nation that rebels against God, like these people, they always wind up in the end being taken captive. They always wind up becoming a prisoner of the enemy. And there's lots of ways that that can happen. It doesn't have to happen with guns and bombs. It can happen economically. It can happen in many different ways. The, the nation could be overthrown without firing a shot. Um, because you and I have gotten to a place, I think, in our pilgrim's progress, if you will, where we're maybe looking at the finish line. We're maybe on the other side of that hill. Maybe we're headed down the hill now towards the finish line. And we know that it won't be long. And it'll be the youth that will be coming up behind us. And I really do believe that, especially when you look at statistics, young people are really in rebellion right now. And they're the ones that are going to be running our country in 25 years or less. That's really a scary thought. It's a scary thought because we see what's going on. We saw, I saw what happened in New York the other day where hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of teenagers gathered together and just tore apart the town. The police couldn't control them. It was pandemonium is a good word for it. Those are the ones that are going to be running this country. They don't want anything to do with God. So where, where is this place going to be in 20, 25 years? I'm kind of glad. I don't think I'll be around. I think I'll be sitting up there with the Lord at that time when that happens. And a lot of us in here will. Some of you younger guys and gals, you might still be around for that. Um, I don't envy you. I don't envy my grandchildren, knowing that they're going to have to come up in that kind of a, a rebellious, ungodly society. Um, and it's amazing to me that our country could be built upon such wonderful Christian principles in the beginning and then wander so far away from what got us where we are. 
It's just amazing to me. It just shows you the foolishness. And it comes to mind, in a psalm it says, The fool has said in his heart that there is no God. The fool has said in his heart, I don't need to obey those rules. I'm going to do whatever my flesh desires. So I'll find gods that I can feed on that with rather than serving the living God. Rather than doing what I know to be right. Now, have you ever met anybody <clears throat> that did not know the difference between right and wrong? The prisons are full. The jails are full. I've, been, I've done ministry in the jails and in the prisons. And I've posed that question to these men on occasion. And I'll just throw it out there. Is there anybody in here tonight that doesn't know the difference between right and wrong? I've never seen one hand go up. Never. Never out of the hundreds and hundreds of people that I have been in front of speaking, nobody raised their hands and said, I don't know the difference. They all do. We all do. And so do our leaders. And so do the kids. And so do all these rebellious uh, individuals out there. They know the difference. But Paul told us there's going to come a time when people will call evil good. I think we're living in that time right now. And not only that, but they're going to call good evil. And you know who that points to? You. You're the one that represents good. And because of that, they hate us. I've heard that some of the spiritualists, if you will, you can call them new age people or whatever, they believe that we are hindering human progress. Yeah. They believe that we need to be removed from the picture. And if they can remove us from the picture, then they can fix the world. We'll be out of the way. And so I keep thinking about when the Lord blows that trumpet and we all are gone. And they're all going to say, finally, you know, finally the earth has purged us from these people. And we can live the way we want to live without them condemning us all the time. Reminding us, what's the difference between right and wrong? Well, we're going to try, they say, real hard to make wrong right <laughs> and right wrong. And we're the target. Uh, so, we, you know, the, the idea here of what's going on in this story, in this nation, the same thing parallel kind of happening in our nation, it's interesting to me. It brings this more home when I read this, because I come to understand that the sin nature has always been the same. The rebellious spirit has always been the same. I think it's really sad that, <coughs> excuse me, I think it's really sad that a lot of us are separated by labels. And I know this is a little bit off topic, but it really is sad to know that we're all kind of in our own little groups. You got a group down the street. You got a group over here. You got a group over there. We're not together. We all claim to have the same God. We all claim to have the same Savior, but we have no relationships with each other because we have these petty differences. And for the most part, they are petty differences. Now, there are some differences that you can't compromise on. Those aren't petty. But for the most part, whether you have 
uh, your government set up one way in the church and they have it set up another way and because they don't like the way you do it, now you're separated. You know, you got the, the first church of all those names. I'd like to know where the second one is. I've never seen the second church, the second Baptist church of you. It's always the first Baptist church. You know, I don't, I don't get it. The fundamentals, the, all these labels that people put on themselves... And I guess that's good, in a sense, that you can look at the label, and you can see the ingredients, and you can know what you're getting into, whether or not it lines up with your belief system or not. So that's a good thing. Labels are important in that way. But they divide us, don't they? And so our nation is not only divided between light and darkness, but even the light is fragmented into little groups. But someday, that'll go away. I can't remember who said this years ago. It, was, uh, it might have been my pastor, Chuck, that said, you know, the church is like, like a, a lake, like a pond. And, and in the pond, there's lots of ducks. But the ducks have built these little circles in the pond so that they all stay within their little circles. Thus, you have all these different groups of churches. He said, but you know, there's going to come a day when the rain's going to fall and the pond is going to rise. And that water level will come up so high that it'll go above those fences. And then all those ducks will come together and be one, one flock, if you will. That'll be a great day, because truly they are our brothers and sisters, and uh, like I said earlier, a minute ago, there are some things that divide us that are valid, but there are other things that are so petty and so unfortunate that uh, we really miss a lot of what we could do. We could be very, very powerful if we were to unite. Anyway, I have to get off that and get back. So let's go into chapter 2. It came to pass, when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And then Elisha, Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. So Elijah's time is coming short. And we have a little preview there in verse 1 of what's going to happen. Now in verse 3, the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, yes, I know. Keep silent. <laughs> don't remind me. I don't really want to know. And then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please. For the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. <clears throat> but Elisha said, as the Lord lives... And as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Elijah's making his final tour here, if you will. Now then the sons of the prophets who were in Jericho came to Elijah and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? <laughs> And so he answered, yes, I know. Keep silent. What do you think about all this repetition as we go through these scriptures? I think repetition is good. Uh, because it's good for us to help us remember things. So here we are in verse 6. Elijah said, stay here, please. For the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. And the answer is the same. 
as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. And 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan. You can imagine this in your mind. And Elijah took his mantle and he rolled it up and he struck the water and it was divided this way and that so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. <coughs> kind of reminiscent of another event that happened with the great prophet leader Moses. We all know the story when he split the waters and they walked across on dry land. This seems like a much smaller thing. Who in here has been to the Jordan to see it? I know, Dan, you've been there. Anybody else here? From what I understand, it's a pretty small, muddy river. It's not this raging, beautiful, clear blue water. It's pretty, pretty muddy. It's not big. And so this, and I'm sure in the rainy season, of course, it swells, but I've seen people going down to get baptized in, in this river, and uh, it looked pretty muddy to me uh, looking at it. But uh, uh, So this is a small thing compared to what Moses did. And it's a very casual thing. It's almost like Elijah was saying, look, we got to get over there. we got to get on the other side. Uh, There's a bridge 10 miles up, and we're not going to do the bridge. So I'm just going to smack the water with my mantle, and we'll just cross right through on dry land. And so that's exactly what he did. A miracle, of course. And again, it just demonstrates... That these, these false gods, all of these Baals, especially Baals above, he was not the god of lightning. He was not the god of the waters. He couldn't do what Elijah has done. And once again, even as he did on Mount Carmel, he, he chose the power of the king and the creator of the universe. These other false gods, they're impotent. They can do basically nothing. So he splits the Jordan, divided this way and that. And the two of them cross over on dry ground. And so it was, when they had crossed over, that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask. What may I do for you before I am taken away from you? And Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And Elisha said in verse 10, You have asked a hard thing. But nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, It shall not be so. So we've seen three different times now when Elijah tries to push away Elisha. Was he testing him? Was it a test? Did he really want Elisha to stay with him to get to this place right here? Because the first time they went to Bethel, And to Jericho and then to the Jordan, all three times, Elijah is trying to tell Elisha, stay back. And I just got to kind of wonder if that was not some type of a, a test. And I would think that Elisha passed the test with flying colors because as the Lord lives, he said, I will not leave you. I am here with you Till the end. And I think that that just kind of sealed the deal for Elisha. 
So verse 11 says, Then it happened, as they continued on and talked, (laughs) that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elisha went up by a whirlwind into heaven. This is probably one of the most bizarre verses in the whole Bible. There's a lot of bizarre verses, but this is one of them for sure. And you get a picture in your mind that they're just walking along together, and out of nowhere, a chariot of fire. It's interesting to me that so many times when God appears or when His presence appears... There's fire and smoke and lightning and noise accompanied with it, with His presence. It's fearful. It's awesome. It it would cause a person to pass out from fear or just from being overwhelmed at the sight and the sound. We see it happen over and over again in Scripture. We see that Daniel, the same thing happened to him. Matter of fact, when Daniel explains his experience, he said, you know, all of my virtue, everything that I thought was good about me went away when I saw God, when I saw his presence, when I was down there by that river and he appeared to me on the river. And the Bible says that Daniel fell down on his face as though he were a dead man. Just totally overwhelmed, blown away, perhaps terrified of what he was experiencing. And here it's interesting to me that when it takes place, that this fire and the chariot of horses separates the two men. Perhaps it happened in between them, and Elisha had to back away, and Elijah was on the other side of it. And uh, Elisha sees it in verse 12. He sees what's going on, and he cries out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more. And he took hold of his clothes, and he tore them into two pieces. And he also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him, and he went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. An amazing, amazing event. So Elijah is one of those that did not die. He was taken up. Who else can we think of in Scripture that was taken up and did not die? Enoch, exactly. Enoch was 360 years old. Interesting to me that uh, that makes a perfect circle. Right? 360 degrees. It's almost as though Enoch fulfilled his purpose. He made the whole circle in life and then God just took him. God took him, Enoch. It says that he was not, for God took him. It doesn't give us a whole lot of detail there, but it's very reminiscent of how Paul describes the rescue of the church. It's reminiscent of how Paul talks about the, the bride being changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and taken up into heaven. What do we call that? Anybody know? What's that event called? The rapture. Is the word rapture in the Bible? No, it's not. Um, But it does speak of being snatched away by force. Now, that's an important part to realize, too, because I think that that may have happened with Enoch. Enoch might not have been ready to cash in his chips. It just tells us God took him. He didn't have anything to say about it, and he was gone. And the church will be the same way. It's as though, I heard a man describing it one time as though you're standing on the corner out here with a friend or a child 
and you're going to cross the street, and your friend or the child steps off the curb, and you see a car coming, and you know that he's going to step in front of the car. So you reach out, and you grab him, and you yank him out of the way of that danger. You've rescued him by force. And that's kind of how the Bible describes this rescue of the bride. We will be taken in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and the next thing we know, we will be in the presence of the Lord, and so shall we ever be. Amen. I'm ready. How about you? Yes. So he has Elijah's mantle now, and he goes and he stands by the riverbank of the Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him in verse 14. <laughs> and he struck the water, and he said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the water, it divided this way and that. And Elijah crossed over. A little bit of a confirmation there, right? This power has been handed down to you. Now, these days, when you're called to ministry, it's not quite that demonstrative, right? But how we do it, we do it with the laying on of hands. We ordain people to go and to be pastors or whatever um, by the laying on of hands, which is a picture of transferring the authority to that person. So generally it would be another pastor or group of pastors that would ordain a man to ministry. Much the same um, reason, but the process is quite a bit different than what we saw here. Instead of having the laying on of hands, he receives this mantle. Now, why he tore his clothes into two pieces, I don't understand that. I don't know why. I hope he had something on underneath it. Um, you know, it's just kind of odd to me that he would just tear his clothes off into two pieces, right? But maybe it was just the robe that he had on. Maybe it was the mantle that he was wearing, his own, uh, ripped around, uh, wrapped around him. But nevertheless, however it was, he grabs Elijah's uh, mantle that he dropped when he was going up in this flame of fire on this fiery chariot. So he takes it and he goes out and he wants to just maybe out of curiosity, but he strikes the water just like Elijah did, and lo and behold, the waters part, and he crosses back over uh, from, from Jordan, and uh, it says in verse 15, when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him, and they bowed to the ground before him. And then they said to him, Look now, there are fifty strong men with your servants. Please let them go and search for your master. Perhaps the Spirit of the Lord has taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, You shall not send anyone. Don't waste time your time. He's in heaven. He's with God. And you are not going to be able to go find him. They acknowledge Elisha, but yet at the same time, they're wanting to go and try to find um, Elijah. And Elisha already knows. You're not going to find him. Don't bother. Don't send anyone. But when they urged him, until he was ashamed, he said, send them. Therefore, they sent 50 men, and they searched for three days. <laughs> but they did not find him. Interesting, three days. And when they came back to him, for he had stayed in Jericho, he said to them, did I not say to you, don't go? And the men of the city said to Elisha, please notice the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord sees. But the water's bad, 
and the ground is barren. And he said, bring me a new bowl. And he put salt in it. So they brought it to him and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. And then he went out to the source of the water. And he cast the salt there. And he said, thus saith the Lord, I have healed this water. And from it there shall be no more death or barrenness. So the water remains healed to this day, according to the word of Elisha, of which he spoke. Interesting. Salt. Don't quite know how that worked, but uh, it was a miracle, without a doubt. And evidently, um, sad enough, it says that people were dying from drinking this water. That women were barren because they drank this water. But once it was healed, thus says the Lord, I have healed this water, and from it there shall be no more death or barrenness. I don't know what the salt part of it is, but kind of reminiscent when the Lord said, you're the salt of the earth. You're, you're the one that brings that healing to the world. We carry that within us, don't we? Because we have the Holy Spirit in us. He also said we're the light of the world. So it puts us in a pretty special place when you think about it. God can heal. And he, can, he does it in ways that man cannot duplicate. And I love that about him. And so verse 23 says, uh, He went up from there to Bethel. And as he was going up the road, oh my gosh, some youths came from the city, talking about the youth earlier, and they mocked him. And they said, go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. <laughs> so he turned around and he looked at them and he pronounced a curse on them in the name of the Lord. And two female bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the youths. And so then he went from there to Mount Carmel. And from there he returned to Samaria. So, you know, he's just got started. He's on his first journey on his own and he's already done two miracles. He must have had a, maybe a little bit of a pride issue or something, I don't know. They mocked him. <laughs> Go up, you bald head. So we know one thing about Elisha. He was bald. He had no hair. Whereas Elijah was a hairy man. Right? He had hair coming out everywhere. And he was known for that. But this man is a little bit different. So, once again, these, these boys, these youths, I would think young men, um, well, they regret mocking the prophet. But from there, look where he goes, to Mount Carmel. Now, it wasn't very long ago at Mount Carmel when Elijah called down fire from heaven. And he returns uh, to the same place, which is kind of interesting to me. And then from there, he goes back to Samaria. So, I think we will pull over and park right there for the night, um, and we'll pick it up next week. One thing that's interesting about <clears throat> these two men, that we have more miracles recorded by Elisha than Elijah. Why that is, I don't know. Um, we know that Elijah did a lot of great things. Some of these miracles that Elisha has done so far, I think they would be put on a scale of small miracles compared to what happened at Mount Carmel. Um, maybe he went by there to see if they had uh, torn down all of their idols and because of what happened there with Elijah, I don't know. But he passes through Mount Carmel and goes back to Samaria, which was the capital at the time. So... Let's leave it there. Let's go ahead and pray, 
And we'll close it up for the night. Father, thank you so much for your word. A lot of things in here um, are quite bizarre to us as we read them. Um, but I think the beautiful thing about it is that you're the one that empowers these men to do what they do. And there can be no denying that only the God of the universe can do these things. And Lord, you have done great things for us too. You have brought us to salvation, to Jesus. You've saved us from ourselves, from our sin. And Lord, that's the greatest miracle of all. Of what you're doing in our lives, it's a miracle. What you're doing in our church, it's a miracle. No man can do these things. Only you could do them. You're the one that changes men's hearts. You set us on a new path. Thank you for that, Lord. Help us to be faithful as we continue serving you each day. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.